Park, we have over 30 different species of native Maine animals. Um, and they're here for a number of different reasons. Most of them are either orphaned, um, injured and rehabilitated. Um, in some cases, they were even illegal pets. Um, so you can come visit the park, just make a reservation online and um, check out our website, mainewildlifepark.com. And you can also see uh, more about all the animals we're gonna talk about today on mefishwildlife.com. Um, so on YouTube, if you want to submit any questions or ask us anything, um, you can use the chat to um, ask us questions. Um, Laura is gonna be helping me answer those questions from the office. So I will ask her as we go um, through the presentation um, if we have questions, but I'm gonna get to most of them at the end. So some of those questions we'll save to the end. So we also have um, all of our past and our upcoming presentations on our website too. So um, these will be recorded and you can watch them in a future time. So again, today we're gonna to talk about amazing adaptations. Before we get started, I wanna talk about what an adaptation is. There are two different types of adaptations. They can be physical or they can be behavioral. And both physical and behavioral adaptations help an animal survive, they help an animal meet their needs. But a physical adaptation is an actual, like part of that animal's um, body. So a good example of a physical adaptation is camouflage. And that can be as simple as an animal's fur, helping them blend into the forest. Um, most mammals you'll see have very natural colored fur, um, browns and grays and blacks, and that's to help them blend in. But it can also be as complex as some animals that can actually change the color of their fur, their skin, their scales, um, depending on the different environment that they're in. So that's a physical adaptation. And then there are behavioral adaptations. One of my favorite examples of a behavioral adaptation is migrating. So we have a lot of animals in Maine that migrate. Um, we have different bird species, fish species, and even insects. Um, and moving from one place to another, that's what migrating is. And when you move from one place to another to find other resources um, at different times of the year is a really good, um, helpful way to survive. So those are adaptations. Also, while we go through this presentation today, I am going to give you three clues to a mystery adapter. So as we go through, I will let you know when I'm gonna give you one of those clues. And then at the end, I want you to try and guess what our mystery adapter is. So let's get started. First, I am going to talk about Maine's largest, most iconic species of deer. Can you guess what animal we're gonna talk about first? So we're gonna talk about moose. This is a big moose antler. Um, this is from one of our moose here at the wildlife park. And this is actually from when he was younger. So the male moose grow antlers. The male moose are called bulls, bull moose. And this is actually from when he's younger. So this um, was one of his first sets of antlers. It's kind of small compared to um, the antlers he grows now that he's a full grown uh, adult moose, um, but it's still really heavy. And when these are actually attached to their heads, they're even heavier um, because they're filled, filled with um, blood and water. So when they shed them, they lose weight because they lose all that wet weight. Um, so they grow these huge antlers. And when you look at this, you might think, how is that a good adaptation? Why does it make any sense to use energy and resources to carry around this big heavy thing on your head? And the answer is, it helps the males get a girl. So they are trying to get um, female moose to have babies. And an important part of survival is passing your genes on to the next generation. So it might seem like it doesn't make sense to carry these around, but it does make a lot of sense for the moose. So some adaptations um, don't make sense to people, but to the animals that have them, it makes a lot of sense. 
and they'll lose these antlers um, in the winter. They shed their antlers when there's less resources. So they don't have to carry them all year. They just carry them around um, when they're trying to find a girl. Another moose adaptation is their fur. So I have this section of moose hair here. You can see it's very thick. They have very dense fur. It's pretty coarse. It's kind of um, like wiry. It's not very soft. And they have dark fur too. And that helps them blend in. Like I was saying, a lot of animals, um, their fur is that natural color of the forest or of their environment to help them blend in, which especially helps when you're as big as a moose is. It can be hard to hide. But they also have special hair. So this is a clump of moose hair. And if I hold a piece, let me find a long piece here. And I sort of bend it like this. You can see it bends kind of in like a perfect 90 degree, but it doesn't break. Moose hair is actually hollow. It's kind of like a drinking straw. Air can actually go inside of their hair. So our hairs are not hollow, our hair is solid but they can trap air in there. And that is a special adaptation because moose live where it's cold. You will never find a happy moose living in Florida. They would be way too hot because their hair is specially adapted for them to live in the cold weather. That air gets nice and warm and it holds that air close to their body. So they're walking around and they're nice and warm and it kind of is like a, a down jacket or a down blanket that that moose carries with it all the time. A behavioral adaptation that all of our moose experience is called the rut. So the antlers and the fur are physical adaptations. Those are on their bodies, those help them survive, but there's also the rut and that's a behavioral adaptation. And they do go through some physical changes during the rut. Um, they'll actually, their muscles will get bigger. Their muscle size increases a lot. And that is a physical difference, but their behavioral differences are even more drastic. So moose are usually kind of slow and lazy. They're very calm, um, big, kind of gentle giants. But during the rut, that changes. During the rut, they get very um, aggressive, I would say. The males fight each other a lot more. Um, and there's actually two different types of fighting. So males will fight each other for a female um, and they will actually like really hurt each other. Occasionally moose will even die when they're fighting each other because they're fighting so hard. But we've also found that moose do what we call sparring. And when moose spar, they're not trying to um, really hurt each other. They're actually doing it for practice. So we see a lot of younger moose and sometimes a little bit older moose um, actually sparring with each other. And it's so that they can practice fighting so that when they are ready to fight a male for real, um, they have a little bit of experience. And the rut often ends very quickly. So they um, will quickly go into this rut and it lasts through the fall, a couple months, and then the rut ends and they go right back to being their, the gentle giants that they are for most of the year. So that's a good example of a behavioral adaptation. Okay, I'm gonna give you your first mystery adapter clue. So pay close attention. I am going to show you the fur of our mystery adapter. Um, like a moose, it has dark brown fur. And this fur is made for keeping them warm in Maine. But unlike a moose, their fur is specially adapted for being in the water. Our mystery adapter spends a lot of time in a very cold, wet um, habitat. So they have special fur that helps them survive in that habitat. All right, we're gonna move on to our next animal now. So I'm gonna show you this animal's skull. Can you guess what animal's skull this is? 
bring it nice and close. And again, this is an animal that's found here in Maine. Their teeth are very similar to people's actually. If you look at these back teeth, they look a lot like our teeth. The only difference is their, their front teeth are much bigger, much longer than ours are. But these back teeth look a lot like people's. This is the black bear skull. So black bears have teeth a lot like ours because black bears eat a lot of the same foods that we do. So black bears are called omnivores. That means they eat both plants and animals. Black bears um, here in Maine really like blueberries. So they'll sit in our blueberry fields and rake up blueberries. Um, they also eat uh, bee larvae and other insect larvae. Um, they don't eat a lot of meat. Um, occasionally, if they find something that um, they can scavenge, so maybe it's already been killed by another animal, um, they might pick at that a little bit. But our black bears eat a lot of um, plants and insect larvae. Also going to show you some black bear fur. So they also have very dark, um, get this moose fur off of there. They have very dark um, fur. It's very thick. And that is gonna help keep them warm. But like I said, they like eating bee larvae. So it's also gonna help protect them from bee stings and other insect bites and stings. So long, um, thick animal hair doesn't just help keep them warm. It also helps protect them from those biting insects. Because they wanna get in there and eat those baby bees and the, the sweet honey that's in there. I'm also gonna show you these claws. So you can see these big sharp claws on this black bear. And I said earlier, these black bears don't um, really hunt a lot of animals. So why would they want these big sharp claws? They use these for raking up blueberries. I said they like eating blueberries a lot. So they'll use those to rake up blueberries. They'll use them to break into and dig into um, insect hives and insect houses, but they can also use them for climbing. So black bears are good climbers, especially young um, adolescent and baby black bears. They are really good at climbing trees. So they're not usually using those claws for taking down another animal. Um, they're using them to scrape up the foods that they like and for climbing trees. All right, we're gonna take a look at some cats. The different felines that we have here in Maine. Can you tell which one of these furs is a bobcat and which one is a Canada lynx? So I have two furs here. This one, is the bobcat, this one that's a little bit smaller. And then this one here is the Canada lynx, a little bit bigger than that bobcat is. We are gonna look at the bobcat first. Both of these cats live in Maine, um, but they have some different adaptations because they live in different places in our state. So bobcats can be found um, in a wide range of habitats in Maine. Um, they can be found just about everywhere. The only place that they really don't like to live is anywhere that has really deep, thick snow. Um, so they are not as common way up in Northern Maine or out in Western Maine um, where we get really heavy snow, um, but just about everywhere else they'll live. And this fur, has all these really beautiful spots and stripes on it. So bobcats, they live in forests and in um, grassy fields. And these spots help them um, camouflage, help them hide in the shadows and in the light in all their ha different habitats. Um, bobcats also have much smaller feet and um, we're gonna take a look at our Canada lynx here because they prefer, get them facing the right way. 
they prefer the opposite habitat as bobcats. So Canada lynx really like living in that deep, thick snow. So you will find them a lot more in northern and in western Maine. Um, they don't usually live in like central or coastal areas at all. Um, they like being deeper in the woods and where they're going to get a lot more snow. So this fur is a lot different than that bobcat fur. It's still really thick and it's going to keep them super warm in that cold weather that they like. But it doesn't have all those spots and stripes. A lot more solid color, that solid kind of gray and brown color. And they have really big feet. So these are their front feet. And then these are their back feet. They have these huge paws. So this cat is a little bit smaller than me, but its paw takes up like the whole size of my hand. And this back foot is this long. That's just its foot on the back foot. So why do you think a cat that lives in deep snow would have big feet like this. These are built in snowshoes. So they are adapted for walking in really deep, thick snow. And these act just like snowshoes. So their body's a little bit smaller, but their feet are really big and it makes it so they don't break through the snow as much. And that helps them catch one of their favorite foods. They love snowshoe hair. And snowshoe hair are also really good at getting around in the snow. So these lynx have to have these big feet to catch those quick snowshoe hair. Um, a couple of other differences um, between the lynx and the bobcat, because people often confuse the two. So lynx have longer um, ear tufts. So they have these hairs on the tops of their ears and the lynx are um, close to twice as long as the bobcat tufts are. And another difference is their tails. So lynx have this black spot on the end of their tail and that spot's gonna be completely black. But on the bobcat, they have white underneath their tail and all these stripes and spots on there. So they both have that short tail, um, but the bobcat again is gonna have more stripes and spots and the lynx is just going to have that black tip on the end um, and the longer ear tufts and really big feet. The bobcats have little tiny feet and the lynx have really big snowshoe feet. So after talking about cats, we have to, of course, talk about dogs. So in Maine, we have three different types of canines. Do you know what the three canine species are in Maine? So we don't have wolves anymore, but we do have Eastern coyotes, gray fox, and red fox. We're gonna take a look at this coyote teeth in this coyote skull. So coyotes have really long skulls, very long noses. That is to help with their sense of smell. Canines have a really, really good sense of smell. They use their sense of smell to find their prey and to communicate with each other. They rely on um, smell and scent to mark their territories and to find their prey. So really long nose and really, really good sense of smell. And when we look at these teeth, we can see again, we have sort of a mix of sharp pointy teeth here in the front. Show this side, sharp pointy teeth here in the front. And then in the back, they're a little bit flatter again. So like the bear, coyotes eat um, a mix of plants and animals. Um, they eat a lot of wild um, fruits and they'll also um, hunt rodents. They really, really like to get some squirrels, um, rabbits, even mice and voles. Um, so they'll get some small mammals and rodents too. Coyotes um, are very opportunistic eaters. And that means that they will eat um, really whatever's easiest or whatever's around them. So they will choose to scavenge or to eat an animal that's already been hunted 
um, overusing the energy to hunt one themselves. But our fox are a little bit different. They are really good hunters. They're very agile. They hunt a lot of their own food. This here is a coyote pelt, coyote fur. And then I have both a red fox and a gray fox for comparison. So this here, this one that is the redder color is the red fox. And this is the gray fox. I'm gonna stand back so we can see the size of them. So the red fox is a little bit bigger than the gray fox, but then the coyote is way bigger. So when I hold them nose to nose touching each other, the coyote, not even including its tail, just its body is close to two feet longer than both the fox are. But they're all canines. Um, I think some people often forget that fox are canines, but fox are, are canines too. So let's take a look at our red fox here. Like I said, they're really good hunters. They're very quick on their feet. They're very agile. Red fox can jump six feet in the air and they will bound all the way up in the air and pounce down to catch their prey. So they're really fun to watch, especially in the winter because they can use that really good sense of smell and also their ears. They have big ears that can catch sound really well. And they will hear a little mouse or a vole um, deep under the snow and they will hunt it and then they'll jump in the air and dive down and grab it all the way through the snow. If you ever get to see a fox hunting, it's really cool. And then our smaller gray fox, they're the smallest um, of the canines here in Maine. They have this really pretty color. They also usually have a little bit of red and brown um, around their faces and on their legs. And they are really good climbers. Just like I was saying about the bears, um, they are the only canines in Maine that will climb up trees. Um, red fox can climb trees, but they are not very good at it and they don't do it very much. The gray fox spend a lot of their time up in the trees um, where they're safe and where they can see overhead um, what's happening down on the ground. And coyotes will actually also hunt fox sometimes. Um, so a lot of times if there's an area where there are a lot of coyotes, um, there won't be a lot of fox there because the fox are prey for coyotes that are the predator. So a lot of fox don't live where coyotes live. Okay, it's time for our second mystery adapter clue. I'm gonna show you a mold of a foot of this animal. So this is our mystery adapter's foot. And what's really interesting is their webbed toes. And these webbed toes help them paddle around in the water and they also um, can waddle around on the land. All right, so we've talked about a lot of different mammals here, um, which mammals are often very popular to us because we are mammals ourselves. So we have a special connection with mammals. But I also wanna talk about some bird adaptations really quickly. Um, there are a lot of close comparisons that we can make to birds. And I always like to compare feathers and fur. So birds have feathers. I have this beautiful turkey tail fan here. And this shows all these different turkey feathers. And just like fur, feathers can help a bird stay warm and dry. Um, it can help them blend into their environment. Um, which are all very important adaptations. But there are two unique adaptations that feathers um, help birds do that mammals can't do. And one of those is flight. Most birds can fly and there's a lot of special adaptations that birds have that help them take off, help them move through the air and also help them land. Um, so feathers help them fly. 
Feathers also serve another purpose, um, sort of like the antlers. Feathers can help a bird show off. It can help a lot of male birds attract a female bird. Um, so you might, again, look at this tail feather and say, this tail feather could attract predators. All these long, fancy, colorful feathers are gonna have a predator running right up to this turkey and eating it for a snack. But what's more important to this turkey is not attracting predators, but attracting a ladybird. So a lot of birds have very fancy um, ornate feathers for attracting other birds. And we have a bird adaptations program coming up in just a couple of weeks. So I'm not gonna talk too much about birds right now, but if you wanna learn more about just bird adaptations, um, we have a program coming up very soon. Um, so check that out. All right, time for our third and final mystery adapter clue. Okay, our mystery adapter is one of nature's engineers. So they don't wear a hard hat like this, but they are very well known for being excellent construction workers out in nature. All right, so I'm gonna go over all of our mystery adapter clues one more time to remind you of them. And then we're gonna try and guess what our mystery adapter is. So the first clue I showed you was their fur. They have dark brown fur and it is well adapted for living in both wet and dry uh, habitats. Number two was their feet. They have webbed back feet for paddling around through the water and waddling on land. And then the final clue was the construction helmet because the mystery adapter is one of nature's engineers. What do you think the mystery adapter is? The mystery adapter is a North American beaver. So this was that fur I showed you earlier. This is a beaver fur. And I showed you those webbed feet. These are from a rubber mold of a beaver's back feet. And the construction helmet, because beavers are one of nature's most famous, well-known natural engineers. And next week, we are doing a program all about Maine's beavers. So next week, more about some of the things I showed you today, plus a lot of other things. Um, and we're also going to be with our wildlife parks beaver um, so that she can hopefully show you some of her adaptations live. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us. And I would love to answer some questions that have come in. So Laura in the office can hopefully pass along some questions to me. Yeah, we've had some great questions and comments going on. So please uh, write your questions and if you have any. Um, so one of our first questions is about moose. Someone would like to know what type of habitat do moose live in? What type of habitat moose live in? That's a great question. So um, moose actually uh, do move around during the season. Um, so different times of year, you'll find the bull moose in a little different bit different spots than you'll find the female moose. And that is all about um, temperature and, and when those female moose have their calves, they wanna be in different habitats. But they always like to be near water. Um, so a lot of people will often see moose um, close to many of the lakes, streams, rivers that we have um, here in Maine. And they do like wooded areas. Um, so they are gonna be in an area that has a good mixture of some fresh water for them to get some yummy um, aquatic veg vegetation from. They like eating that. And um, also a combination of forest for them to cool off and hide out in um, when they need a break. 
great, thank you. And then the next question is about the lynx and the bobcat. Are the lynx twice as big as the bobcats? So lynx and bobcats do usually have a, a size difference. Um, lynx are usually bigger, but we can't say that all bobcats are twice as small or all lynx are twice as big. Um, this is a pretty good sized lynx. Um, I would say this is average or slightly above average size for a lynx. And then the bobcat, um, so this one doesn't have the, the pelt doesn't have the legs completely attached. Um, so normally its legs would be a lot longer than the ones that are on this fur. But this is an average size bobcat. Um, so I don't know that they're exactly um, half as big or half as small, um, but the bobcats are usually quite a bit smaller than the lynx are. That's great, thank you very much. So let's see, we have a few more questions coming in. I just wanna remind people that we'll take a few more if you have any, so please write them in the chat. Um, can coyotes have different colored furs? Yes, that's an awesome question. So our coyotes here in Maine um, have a lot of variation in their fur color. Um, so this one that I showed you, let me get that one again. Um, this combination of um, fur here can actually show you a lot of different colors in it. So I'm gonna hold it a little bit closer. We have black, we have this like light blonde color in here. Um, there are certain spots that are more of a golden red or golden brownish orange. Um, and we have a lot of color variation in coyotes um, and in a lot of wildlife in general. So they can be very, very light blonde colored um, on their entire bodies. They can be blonde. They can also be what we call melanistic. And that means that they're black. So a melanistic animal um, has a lot of melanin in their skin causing their fur to be really, really dark. And the opposite side of that is albino animals. So albinos don't have any melanin in their skin. So they are completely light colored or white. Um, and then there's a range all in between of grays and browns, um, blondes and orange. So this fur shows a lot of nice um, different colors in it. Um, but some coyotes are more of a solid blonde, solid black, solid brown. Um, they have a lot of color variation. Great question. And to go along that line, someone would also like to know to know if um, any of our foxes, the red or the gray fox, change their fur. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the mammals I showed you today will change their fur color. Um, for different seasons and also their fur thickness for different seasons. So a lot of the furs I showed you are more of a winter fur. Um, they're really, really thick and very dense. So in the summer, they'll shed a lot of that. And um, they can also change their colors based on different seasons. So the fox um, don't completely change color. They won't go from red to white or red to black or anything like that. Um, but they might have a lighter red or a darker red during different seasons. We do have some animals like um, the ermine that are here. They're a little small weasel that we have in Maine and they completely change their color. So in the summer and in the spring, they're brown. And then once it gets to shorter days, um, they actually change their fur color to white to blend in with the snow in the winter. So pretty cool adaptations. Very amazing thing that these, all these animals do. And another question about foxes, what do foxes eat? Yeah, so like the coyote, um, fox are omnivores. I don't have a fox skull here with me today. I think that probably in our last adaptations video, um, I did show a fox skull but they're gonna be very similar to a coyote skull, just a little bit smaller um, with a few other changes, but they have very similar teeth and they have a very similar diet. So they're gonna eat um, a lot of those rodents and, and small mammals again. So they, they like mice and rabbits, um, chipmunks and squirrels. 
but they also eat plants. So they'll also eat um, wild berries and, and other plants that they'll find in the wild too. So they have a very mixed diet um, of all kinds of different stuff. All right, I'm just gonna let everybody know. I'm gonna ask just uh, two more questions here, but you can always uh, send us a message later or visit mefishwildlife.com for more information. Um, so an another question would be about black bears. Uh, people are wondering where do they, do they live? What kind of habitats do they like? Yeah, so black bears um, will also be found in different areas during different times of the year. So we are coming into uh, spring and summer we'll start seeing black, bear, black bears um, a lot more as they are becoming more active as the days get longer and it warms up. I mentioned that they like to use their claws for getting blueberries and insects. Um, so in the summer, if you live anywhere near any blueberry fields or open um, agricultural fields like that, you can find black bears there. However, one of the nicknames for black bears is ghost of the forest. And we call them ghosts of the forest because they have this really dark fur and this acts, makes them look just like a shadow in the woods. Um, so they can be really hard to find when they're in the forest and when they're in the woods. Um, you have to be really looking for them. But uh, bears live in a lot of different habitats throughout Maine. If you wanna safely see a black bear, um, I would recommend in like those agricultural and those blueberry fields where they're out in the open and you might see them a little bit better because they're really hard to see when they're in the woods. Yes, and as, as we all know, this is the time of year that a lot of animals are having their, their babies. And so we do have a question about that. Um, do lynx have a certain way that they attract a mate? And do you know how many babies they have? Yeah, so um, I had talked earlier about the coyotes being very um, scent, uh, very well adapted to smelling in their scent. And cats are very similar. So cats use scent marking um, to mark their territories. And that scent that they mark and that they spray um, can also tell them a lot about if they're looking for a mate, um, if they're ready to have babies, all of those kinds of things. So um, they don't have flashy colors like, uh, like a cardinal or like a bird would, and they don't necessarily um, go into the rut or grow antlers like a moose would, but they use their scent marking um, to tell other cats when it's time to have babies. Um, and as far as how many babies they have, most lynx I think you usually have two to three um, in like a litter at a time, um, that probably can give or take one, but usually they have two to three. That's great information. And we do want to remind people that whenever you see, um, babies in the wild, always give them space because mom's probably nearby. All right. So we're going to ask this one last question. It's kind of a, a fun one. We're all wondering why do Bobcat and Lynx have tufts? I actually don't have an answer for that question. Um, either. That's a good one though. Yeah. So there are some parts on animals that we don't fully understand. Um, one of the good ones here in Maine is on our moose. A lot of them have this um, piece of fur and skin that hangs down under their chin. We call it their bell. And we have no idea why moose have a bell. We don't know why that's on their heads. Um, and I think it's similar for tufts. Um, on these cats. It could be something that is an adaptation, like I said, that we just don't understand yet. Um, as people, we have different senses and we um, have different needs and different survival than a lot of these animals do. So that tuft on the ear could be um, a sign of their health or if something like that, that signals to other cats for communication. Um, but it's all kind of educated guesses that we have. Um, and we can I'm try not, to find out sure. too. We can try to see if we can find out. We can reach out to our biologists and see um, just a quick look online. It seems it has something to do with helping to protect their ears from debris, all sorts of things like that. But that's the wonderful thing about, about learning about these. You can always learn more. 
So we'll see if we can find the answer and we'll add it to the chat later. Yeah. All right, so I think that's it for questions for now. Um, like Laura said, you can always send us in um, more questions that you might have. Um, visit mefishwildlife.com or visit mainwildlifepark.com um, to learn more about the wildlife park, inland fisheries and wildlife, and all the different animals that we talked about today, plus a lot more. Um, I also do wanna mention it is springtime. Um, we are gonna start seeing a lot more animals getting active. And like Laura said, it is a big time for animals to be having their babies. So we wanna always make sure that we're living safely with wildlife. Um, on mefishwildlife.com slash living with wildlife, we have different tips and advice um, for avoiding animal conflicts and for keeping wildlife wild and keeping them safe out in nature. Um, so thank you all again for um, watching today. And if you want to see our upcoming programs or to watch any recordings from past programs, they're on ME Fish Wildlife slash field trips or on our YouTube page um, for Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your Friday. <laughs>